Is the government too weak to stand up to the energy companies? If we really want to deal with high energy prices in this country, there is only one so solution. That is getting more supply, and that is fracking on a massive scale throughout Britain. For capitalism to really work, you have to interfere. And just as in the past we put a tax on utility companies when they overcharged, and just as the Conservative Party in the early 1980s put a tax on North Sea oil because there were excessive profits there, these are the moments when politicians interfere in the market for the good of the public. Um, what Tristram says would be more compelling if, when Labour was in power, we hadn't started with 14 energy companies and ended with six. I mean, how do you, how do you under... get more to come back well, in now? What do you do? First of all, we want more investment in the industry, and we've seen some announcements today the Chancellor's been uh, overseas and we're going to have more investment. We need to diversify away from being completely reliant on fossil fuels. Yeah, but you said more companies. You want and we more need more companies. companies. We've how do you got, get them in, we've got, say, to gas or got, to oil? We've or got two new smaller companies in the marketplace. We want more competition. What about giving and up we some of more, this green stuff and we need charges, more costs over 11% on people's well, bills? I think what we need you to do... want to go through that and say we could cross some of this off? Well, what we need to do is we need to move away from a dependence on imported gas. We need a mix of energy supplies. We need some nu more nuclear. We need uh, renewable energy. We need some gas and we need some coal. Is it fair to say that privatisation of the energy companies hasn't worked and that the only way to bring down the prices is to, um, to renationalise them? Is that your view? Let's just hold on to that. And, uh, and the third row from the back. Peter O'Bourne was probably right. Um, when the Labour Party was last in, they allowed the uh, producers to merge with the distributors, which has distorted the market. They, inst they installed a whole set of green energy policies which are taking a, an ever-increasing proportion of the bills. <laughs> <clears throat> and a lot of the investment in infrastructure is to tie in um, windmills and other uneconomic energy sources. But do you think the government can stand up to the en energy companies, which was the question? Um, I don't think they should stand up to the energy companies. They should get out of the way of the energy companies and stop putting on energy right. taxes. And inefficient so, energy and so forces to use inefficient energy sources. Okay. D Diane James. Well, thank you for all your comments, um, ladies and gentlemen. I'm listening to this argument and just thinking I've got Ed Miliband and David Cameron completely out of touch with what's going on out there. You've got one uh, po political party leader saying fixed prices. Well, you can do that. That's already been found. There's fixed rates out there. And you've got another one suggesting that suddenly there's going to be this magical new company who's going to be completely immune to what's happening with the market out there and is suddenly going to make price of energy massively cheaper. Um, this blame culture, it worries me a little bit. You know, we've had bash the bankers. We're, you know, bashing the next, uh, next sector in the economy. When it comes down to it, if we took out uh, this huge element of the EU obligations in terms of energy, the reliance that we've now got on imported gas to make up for the fact we've closed so many coal-fired power stations, we've taken away an indigenous power source that we had here, and we're now saying we're going to go for fracking, which I agree with Peter on, I would do, because that's a UKIP policy. But, you know, that's going to take at least 10 years before it comes on stream to such an extent that we'll make up for the deficit so, we're so in. So it's the EU's fault, according to you, it's, not surprisingly. It's, but, one, but, it's one element of the, uh, the fault. Everything the EU's fault. Yeah, well, it might, well, you might well think so, uh, Mark, but <laughs> when it comes down to it, you know, we've got this emphasis on the renewable sector that's meant to suddenly, like a white charger, come into the energy market. So you take out that 11% or so that's spent well, on all different Absolutely, and, you know, the gentleman made the, the whole point thing, in terms of inefficiency efficient wind turbines, for instance. What about home improvements, well, which cost pretty nearly half for the What was the it, bill. 12 households have taken up the Green Deal? Yes. 12 households? I mean, you know... It adds £47 the, pounds to the fuel absolutely. bill, even though nobody uses it. You know, what a waste it, of money, everybody. What a waste of money. Okay. You, sir, in the third row. The, the problem with capitalism in this instance is that there's no competition. So who do you switch to? So now we have a discussion about fracking. The only reason we're discussing fracking is because of lobbyists exerting power. It will not bring down energy prices. It's locking it's us US, onto a fossil fuel future, okay. which we don't need. And this is only weeks after the IPCC report saying we need to move away from fossil fuels. I'm listening to sort of whinging from left-wing politicians about the cartels which don't actually exist. Well, let's have a bit of long-term thought, please, Mr well, Hunt. Well, well, I'll tell uh, you exactly. Yeah. In <laughs> 
can the UK cope with any more immigration after Christmas? Diane James, UKIP has strong views on immigration. We do indeed, and uh, thank you for your question. I don't believe we can, it's as simple as that. We've got no idea, you, I'm sure everyone will agree, exactly how many people are going to come from the two countries in question, where the current restrictions on them uh, coming into the UK... Bulgaria and Romania, you're talking about. I'm talking about Romania and Bulgaria. But what we do know, for instance, is that there's two million of them in Spain, They've already made that move. The likelihood, therefore, of them coming to the UK is pretty high. We also know that the government will not admit what sort of forecast they have. Uh, and then we've got this latest EU commissioner report and this whole issue of over 600,000 in inactive EU migrants here already. 73% increase in the number that haven't got a job. And what that does mean, if we translate that, and I think we can translate that, I'm not going to uh, uh, detract from that, there is going to be a pressure when these two countries, their restrictions are lifted and those people are going to come here. And they are going to come here. It's a very, very nice deal coming to the UK in terms of access to benefits. And I'm sure Mark is going to try and come back on me and say, well, we've got this under control. The coalition, the Conservatives, haven't got it under control. Well, what would you have a government do that was within the law? Of the, of the EU, of which we're members, until well, I wouldn't UKIP be, gets its way. I wouldn't be messing about with this discussion of repatriation of powers. It would just be a straightforward, no, they cannot come in, and the way to achieve that is out of the EU. It's as simple as that. The idea that this is all about the EU and there's nothing we can do, which is UKIP's contention, is nonsense. The government's reduced net migration by a third since oh, we've rubbish. come to power. Mark, you we've know that's still... rubbish. No, that is absolutely true, It's uh, not, Diane. because you, yeah, can't, no, Diane, you can't count them in it, it and you true. can't count them Th out. Those are robust figures that the Independent Office for National Statistics put together. It, clearly some people will come here. Um, we'll have to see what happens, but they can go to eight other European countries. Um, and we, we haven't made a forecast. There are no secret You're not forecasts. made a forecast? No, we haven't. Because why haven't you made a forecast? Because our experts have advised us, have said that trying to make a forecast when you've got right. eight other countries... There's a country you can go and talk well, to people. You when you survey, well, you survey public these, well, opinion in this country well, every five all, minutes of the day, both the, parties. All, you, you alter your policies to survey, fit every little well, tiny change. And you're saying you can't go to well, many more guarantees before well, what their plans all are. The I'm a district councillor in the neighbouring uh, um, borough, which is uh, a hard district council, and uh, one of our biggest issues is the development, development of all the houses that have to put in. We just had our local plan uh, thrown away by the government because they're saying we, we factored in a zero net migration number, um, and they've said absolutely not, that's, that's, not, that's not the case, um, you have to develop more houses. We're talking about 3,500 houses in Hart District Council over the next 15 years. Yeah. Now the government practically wants us to double that. Where are we going to put 7,000 new houses in Hart District Council? How are, we, how are we going to have the bandwidth in our schools and our hospitals and so on and so forth to accommodate all of those people? What good will it do if he finds out that the, the, the gentleman from Hart because is correct and he's got to build 7,000 instead of 3,500 homes? Because you've got to plan. I'm going to give you one fact, which is absolutely central to this whole argument. And that is that the average wage in Bulgaria and Romania is le le approximately half the minimum wage in Britain. It does have, I'm afraid, an I, I thought the councillor up there described it absolutely beautiful, a massive effect on public services, schools, housing, all of these things. <laughs> now, <clears throat> the Tory elite in this area have got it totally wrong. In my town, we're close to waiting 21 days for a doctor's appointment. In my county, they're about to pull down four care homes. Those care homes are the family silver. They love, they look after, they manage our elderly well. But we're going to pull them down and we're going to put it out to privatisation. We are so out of touch in this area, it's who's, unbelievable. Who's, Hold on, who's, let's finish the point. They, they have completely lost control of what is happening at a local level. The cuts, the cuts have gone far too far. It's time to start rebuilding the fabric of our society rather than the Tory way of destroying Absolutely. it. And can I... Absolutely. Just to check, yes. Um, how, is, how, how is that relevant to immigration from Bulgaria and Quite Romania? simple, quite simple. We cannot take any more. Our county cannot absorb any more. We right. are full.
Mark we're going to close to business pretty soon. Well, Mark Hubbard, there's two things. You're not alarmed at the open door policy on both Bulgaria and Romania. Well, we haven't got an open door. Well, you have got no, an open door. No, we haven't. Who is not allowed uh, in? Other people come here to work. We so who isn't allowed we, in? Well, we've tightened on, up. In, in January the first. We've tightened up the access to benefits, we've tightened up the access to services and access, for example, to social housing, so local councils, for example, can prioritise access to social housing. So you make it undesirable to come here, is what And if saying. they come here to work and contribute and pay taxes and make a contribution, I have no problem with that. But The discussion has nothing to do with xenophobia. It's all about jobs, services, and we're still having large amounts of youth unemployment in this country. Hmm. How is more immigration? What effect is that going to have on that? I, 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 I think it's... Hold on, hold on. We have a housing crisis. Like, it was on the news last night. Thousands of people are living in bed and breakfast with their families. Like, thousands of people are going to come to this country, and where are they going to stay? There's no effort for them to stay. And it is easy to say it's xenophobic, which a horrible amount of it is. But behind there is a logistical argument. I don't disagree with that. I'm pleased. Okay. I'm not calling yeah. it xenophobic. Let I'm me go to the questioner up there at the back, and then I'll come to you. I really feel for our young people. And, um, well done. Yeah. Yeah. Diane James, brief point. Uh, yes, despite what Mark would like to convince us, he, the Conservatives and the Coalition are not controlling immigration. And if, and I, I'm a fellow borough councillor, by the way, so I empathise and sympathise with you completely. The comment has been made that even with the current national housing targets, we would have to build one new home every seven minutes. And if we don't control immigration, when we get to the end of the next 15-year programme that the coalition government has introduced, we're going to have to embark on another huge round of house building. Now, we've got to, call it, we've got to start saying enough is enough at some stage and bring control back into this country as to where the infrastructure goes, where the housing goes, where it's mm. allocated, and that is not happening with Mark mm. and his team in, in government at the moment. The, I don't know whether you've seen the same um, issues and the papers that have come out. Allocating the housing as it is, you can drive a coach and horses through it. Mm. It's an absolute nonsense. OK, I'm going to take one more point. Should I still believe my mother's advice that you can always trust a police officer? I think it's fair to say that these three officers have made no comment since, and, the, and the, the chief constables who decided not to discipline them have asked to go before a parliamentary well, committee to explain why. So yes. there, there may be... I mean, there are two stories. And well, Andrew Mitchell still has not made an official complaint. Let's put this all into context. I mean, I'd like to see some a statement from him i mean to go, to go back to your question John, um, yes. very quickly i think we the our element of trust has been severely undermined and you know the next time i hope it isn't uh, stop for speeding points or something like that but um, you know if i'm going to be questioning am i going to get a rightful hearing but what worries me more than anything is what was effectively a, a relatively <coughs> simple spat that involved rather colorful language if we look at this has suddenly developed into something much more serious. And the seriousness of it is, is this the police fighting against the cutbacks and using this as ammunition, or is it just a, you know, the usual cover-up type scenario? And that's what worries me more than anything. You know, are we just watching this battle being fought out over something very, very fundamental? Mm. And as you say, uh, you know, recognising your question, undermining our trust in the police. The, the Independent Police Complaints Commission did say, of course, that they were running a successful, I quoted, high-profile anti-cuts media campaign. Absolutely. Account... Should teachers' pay be performance-related? I don't actually see the need for performance-related pay. And, you know, that's my straight answer on this, because the minute we start putting targets in place, the minute we start engineering abuse of those targets... And we've already seen a situation where employers have lost confidence in exam results, no matter how well the, the children think they've done and how proud the parents might be. We've seen teachers already manipulating uh, results, you know, focusing on certain students that are at the lower end to push them up into a different category. So the minute we start 
social engineering on that scale in the teaching profession, I think, is the wrong way to go. Okay. We've got a very, very clear message out there, which is, at the moment, is that there's been too much political interference in the education system. Mm. You've only got to look at countries like Singapore, which has maintained its system unchanged for years. It's held up as being, you know, a top model in terms of student quality output and this sort of thing. And, you know, Michael Gove, to give him some credit, he's going back to some fundamentals, which is a good, solid syllabus, focus on, if you like, the, you know, the, the three R's, all this sort of thing. And that's what's needed if we're going to prepare our young people in a global and a very demanding world. Simple right. as that. <laughs>